Hello everyone, uh, my name is Olivia Woodrow and I will be moderating today's session along with Jessica Keane on behalf of ICU DDR. And we want to express our gratitude to our esteemed presenters today and welcome you all to this virtual session. Uh, as you will see when you enter the session, your microphone is not set on mute. And so we ask that you please put it on mute um, until we adjourn to the breakout discussion part of the session. Uh, the structure for today's session will be as follows. <clears throat> uh, panel presentation, um, followed by a breakout discussion about the topic presented. And during this time, you can share the work that you've done in your region, university, and discuss any challenges and questions that you may have. And then we'll return to a large group and discuss what was raised in the breakout sessions and include what we can also we can all do as ICU DDR members to move this important work forward. Also, this is just a reminder that if you go to the ICU DDR website, you can see uh, a lovely welcome message along with links to the poster sessions that are also being held as part of this conference. So, you can go and check those out. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today's panel. Uh, uh, Susanna Enrique has a PhD in sociology, and she's a researcher at the Center for Research and Studies in Sociology and a professor at the Portuguese Open University, UAB. At UAB, she's been the coordinator of the specialized training in the Prevention of Addictions course, the first university e-learning study program based on the adaptation of the EUBC. Carrie hopkins Isles has a master's degree in criminology and is a certified addictions professional. She teaches at a university in Florida and is the direct deputy director for our hosts, ICU DDR. She's been in the addiction field as a clinician, trainer, and administrator for 18 years. So I am now very pleased to hand over to Susanna to begin the session. Thank you. Uh, Susanna, just to check, you might need to make sure that you're uh, unmuted. It's okay now? Yes, perfect. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I was saying uh, hello to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, especially to Carrie um, for the invitation and the opportunity to present my, my work. I come from the um, the Portuguese Open University, which is a ECU DDR member. And um, my presentation is about uh, e-learning techniques uh, in this scenario of moving to an online teaching format. Um, technology is leading to massive changes in every dimensions of our daily life, in the economy, in the way you communicate and relate to each other, and increasingly in the way we learn. As a consequence of the growth in knowledge-based work is the need for more people with higher levels of education uh, that previously uh, resulting in a demand for more highly qualificated workers in every area, um, which is an opportunity. And uh, virtual pedagogical models are very important when we are in these scenarios, virtual learning scenarios, and refers to a multidimensional construction that represents a vision of learning and that has a pedagogical architecture, lines of forth, and theoretical principles in line with one or more educational theories. In that sense, it assumes itself as a general frame of reference for educational activities and simultaneously as an organizing instrument of practices, teaching and learning in online environments. At the Portuguese Open University, 
we have an exclusive virtual mod mod pedagogical model in which architecture is based on organizational aspects related to the objectives of the educational process, the social organization of the virtual community where the roles, rights and duties of each, other, of each actor are defined, methodologic aspects related to activities, interaction, evaluation procedures, uh, and technological aspects related to the definition of the virtual learning environment, which in our case is the Moodle platform, and also scientific content. The lines of force are student-centered learning, making students actively responsible for their knowledge building, building process, Education based on flexibility of ethics to learning contents and activities, prioritizing a synchronous communication in which space and time do not have to coincide, since communication and interaction is made whenever it is convenient for the student or the trainee, allowing to uh, read, process the information, think about it, and engage in dialogue and interaction. Education based on diversified interaction between student prof, a professor, student, student, and uh, student contents, planned according the professor's pedagogical strategy. Education that promotes digital inclusion, that helps uh, students to assess and master technologies who might not otherwise be able to develop those skills. And finally, constructivism as a theory in education that recognizes the learner's understanding and knowledge based on their own experiences prior to entering school. The key point here is that for constructivists, learning is seen as essentially a social process requiring communication between learner, teacher, and others. This social process cannot effectively be replaced by technology, although technology may facilitate it. The virtualization of educational systems that are currently obliged to carry out presupposes the, the alteration of their models and practices it forces professors to assume new roles and to communicate in ways he was not used to. The teacher, more than transmitting knowledge, must now guide students' learning process in order to develop their skills, namely learning to learn, autonomy, and so on. The teacher must accompany, motivate, dialogue, be a leader, be a, motivator, be a mediator. It is also expected that the, the, the professor Play your role of self and death row evaluator of content and performance. It is also expected that it will support and stimulate students regulating and guiding their emotions, affections, and attitudes. For communication and interaction in digital network education scenarios, you should use clear language that allows students to understand the information and guidelines regarding the activities they may perform, they have to perform, using friendly and positive and closeness tone, creating an auspicious environment for students' learning. Plan the communication moments so that they reach students in time. Suggestive spaces for a synchronous collaborative communication, guide, mediate, and direct debates toward learning objectives and contribute to the construction of sharing um, of knowledge and experiences. Establish communication and participation rules for different spaces. And being an online teacher doesn't mean being on, always online. This is important. Um, the activities. Uh, these are activities carried out in digital learning environments. Are actions that students take to achieve some certain specific objectives or to develop certain specific skills through their learning process? Are frameworks for enabling active and participative online learning by individuals and groups? 
They focus on learners who are contributing, providing, reworking, interpreting, combining most of the knowledge. They overturn the idea that learning depends on the big, ex big expert, expert and his over over aim of knowledge. They are based on the strong idea that knowledge is constructed by learners through and with others. Dylan wrote this song, uh, The Times They Are a Changing, uh, as a deliberate attempt to create a new theme of change for the time. And it is still updated, that's why I, I put it here. Um, technologies are merely tools that can be used in a variety of ways. What matters more is how technologies are applied. The same technology can be applied in different ways, even or specially in education. So, in judging the value of technology, we need to look more closely at the ways in which it is being or could be used. Over time, through internet, media have tended to become more communicative, asynchronous and rich, thus offering teachers and learnings more powerful tools for teaching and learning. The best teaching is always built upon relationships and knowledge construction is based upon interaction between students, students' content, students' professor. Um, another important aspect is, are the uh, open educational resources, which is an educational um, movement. Um, these OER are freely available openly licensed sources that are useful for teaching, learning, and assessing, as well as for research purposes. These open educational resources offer many benefits, but they need to be well designed and embedded within a rich learning environment to be effective. The increasing availability of these open educational researches and open data um, could mean that in the future, um, most of academic context, content will tend to be open and freely accessible over the internet. As a result, students will increasingly look to institutions for learning support and help with the, with the development of the skills they need in a digital age, rather than with the delivery content. OER, MOOCs, open textbooks, open textbooks, and other digital forms of openness are important in helping to an access to learning opportunities. But ultimately, these are enhancements rather than a replacement of a well-funded education system, which remains the core foundation for enabling equal access to ed educational opportunities. Assessment, it is also very important uh, in online learning scenarios because learning and instruction are increasingly competence-based. The call for assessment met methods to adequately determine, determine, determine sorry, competence is growing. This PRACT model was developed at the Portuguese Open University. Uh, there are other models. And this one is a framework of 10 quality criteria uh, for competence assessment and uh, the programs. And it is based on practicality, consistency, authenticity, transparency that uh, links with society, institutions, teacher, and students. The intention is develop, to develop assessment tasks in which students stop exclusively talking or writing about knowledge and start to put into action in order to demonstrate their skills, leading them to think, decide, and act in the real world. These tasks involve a combination of knowledge, skills, and attributes that will later be used in the professional context, that is, tasks that assesses competences and not mere knowledge. Well-planned online learning experiences are meaningfully different from courses offered online in response to a crisis or a disaster. 
universities working to maintain instructions during the COVID-19 pandemic should understand those differences when evaluating this emergency remote teaching. The primary objective in these circumstances is not to recreate a robust educational ecosystem, but rather to provide temporary access to instruction and instructional support in a manner that is quick, quick to set up and is reliably available during an emergency or crisis. Quality is teaching methods that successfully helps, help learners to develop the knowledge and skills they will require in a digital age. It's about you helping your students to develop the knowledge and the skills they will need. And to do this, Tony Bates proposes this uh, process. Decide how you want to teach, decide on mode of delivery, work in a team, build on existing resources, master the technology, set appropriate learning goals, design course structure and learning activities, communicate and never stop communicating, evaluate and improve, and have a very good time management along all this process. At a European level, um, Considerations for Quality Assurance of e learning Provision, published in 2018, supplemented the ESG, uh, providing additional guidance and indicators. And at, the, at an international level, we have the ESO um, in that um, give us also some guidelines and standards for the quality for e learning. Now I will briefly present you uh, two opportunities for training and professional development of addictions workforce through network digital education and based on my recent work and research. The first one is a virtual community of addiction experts set up to share evidence-based programs of prevention on novel psychoactive substances in use in Portugal. Um, communities of practice are formed by people who engage in a process of collective learning in a shared domain of human endeavor over time, and their nature are informal. Members may collaborate online, uh, for instance, if they do not share a location, um, and in this case, they form a virtual community of practice. Here, members use technology and virtual environments to develop their diverse activities, such as problem solving, sharing information and experience, reusing assets, coordination and strategy, building an argument, growing confidence, discussing options and developments, mapping knowledge and identifying gaps. The online and NPS workshop was delivered by the Portuguese Open University. Uh, it integrated 16 Portuguese experts in prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and law enforcement professionals spread by the national territory, continental, and islands like Madeira and Azores. This was the one first experience, but the study, the study yielded some encouraging encouraging signs of how much such a community could operate, support each other, and share knowledge. And is illustrative of the need of continued development of a virtual community of practice with prevention experts. This specific experiment evidences and underscores the lack of specialized personnel in the healthcare field in Portugal, which uh, connect interdisciplinarity uh, uh, practice and cooperation for drug addiction prevention, treatment, and harm reduction, particularly in NPS. Communities of practice offer an innovative layer in the implementation of evidence-based prevention programs, supported by the establishment of registries, training initiatives, and quality standards. The second one 
is the specialized training in addictions prevention. Um, the training curriculum has been developed by a European project, the UPC ADAPT, co-founded by the European Commission, where 11 partners uh, adapt the universal prevention curriculum to suit the European context. Um, the course represents the first real e-learning-based university adaptation running in a standard regime in Europe and the Portuguese University, um, the Open University has joined Charles University in Prague in making effective use of programs and materials based on the original UPC curriculum at the university context. Thank you for your, your attention, or in my own language, obrigada. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. I, I forgot when I decided to go after you how much more um, erudite you are and how mine is not. <laughs> well, <It's> not true. <laughs> oh, all right, let me share. Let me remember how to do it. Okay. Okay, can you see that? Yes. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Susanna. I love presenting with you. Your information is so helpful, especially during this time when we've had to make so many changes and you were way ahead of the curve, so we appreciate you. And um, I'm going to come from a little different perspective as someone who was not used to and not really familiar with online learning per se, except for in my role in ICU DDR, but not as a faculty member. So I'm Carrie Hopkins Isles, and as was mentioned, I'm the deputy director here for ICU DDR. And I also teach at a university in Tampa, Florida, in the US. And so when everything happened with COVID-19, of course, we all sort of went into crisis mode. And I myself was teaching a course in criminology, and it's a tr course on trauma. And it's a real, we really have great discussions and activities in class and things of that nature. So it was c quite a shock to change to an online forum, especially without really any training or assistance to do that. So honestly, I sort of just did what I do best, and this is what Susanna mentioned that I find so important, which is that you can't teach without relationship. And so coming from a counseling background, coming from a background as a um, someone who ran programs, as well as my personal, um, I'm also a yoga teacher, I just moved into kind of naturally this role of teaching to the whole person. So I have some visuals here that I thought were really interesting and helpful. And so we have the whole person, this holistic concept, and the intellectual, physical, emotional, and spiritual. So I'm gonna go into that some. So I think primarily as university faculty or trainers, we tend to teach primarily to the intellectual part of our students, and that's appropriate. That's our role in most cases. But given the fact that we are in a crisis situation and that we may remain in a similar situation like that for some time, I think we have to adjust that style to make sure that our students' needs are met more holistically. Otherwise, they really won't be able to attend to that intellectual part. So I like this um, visual. If you're familiar with Maslow, he is a psychologist who studied positive human qualities. And in 1954, he created the hierarchy of human needs, and he expressed his theories in this book, Motivation and Personality. And so I, I love, this is a really simplistic version, but I love this because it shows us that while we would like to be teaching maybe at a esteem or self-actualization level, if our students are still in this physiological level, and I'm gonna go into more detail what that means, they're not gonna be able to be up here where we'd like them to be. So 
Physiologically, people need to be safe. They need to make sure they have food, water, warmth, rest. This may seem straightforward and seem obvious to most of us. However, we had a presentation earlier this morning talking about domestic violence. That's an example where you may have students who are going back to homes where there's violence in the home. So they're not getting enough rest, for example. They may not be getting basic needs met. And so we'll talk about what we can do with that, but the important thing is for us to remember as educators that if our students are not getting those basic needs met, then they're not going to be able to, again, come up with us to where we want them to get intellectually. So, as I mentioned, being able to breathe, have food, water, sleep, you know, all the important things that we need for survival, and then feeling safe and secure. And unfortunately, as a society, and I'll speak primarily for the U.S. at this time, but certainly other places around the world have the same issue, whether it's during COVID or at any time, where people don't feel safe, they don't feel financially secure, they don't feel stable. We really, one of the things that we crave is order and predictability. And so that's something that in a lot of parts of the world, people are not feeling now or in general. So moving up into our psychological needs, we all wanna feel that we belong. We wanna have these intimate relationships with friends. And right now it's difficult because people can't necessarily reach out in the same way that they did before. They can't just go sit with other students and have a cup of coffee and, and study for courses and things like that. And they may not be able to have the same sense of accomplishment or the same prestige needs. So, of course, there's no way that we could meet all of the needs of our students. And that, frankly, wouldn't be our role. But we are an authority figure in the lives of our students. And the idea would be for us to be a trusted authority where our students can check in with us, where we can check in with them, and where we can offer them some knowledge of resources, especially that our institutions have, and perhaps that our communities have available to them. So how do we know if one of our students has a physiological need. We, just a reminder that when you come into the training, you are unmuted, so you're, we may hear your background noise. So we're not gonna know right off the bat if our students have physiological needs. And I think sometimes we get nervous to try to inquire, but as a counselor, I would always, and as someone who is an administrator and trained counselors, I would always say we just need to ask. So we need to ask our students what they need. One of the things is I used to say at, at the end of the semester, last semester, when um, COVID really hit us quickly, I used to ask my client or my students, are you safe? Now, most of them weren't going to answer that right in the middle of class in front of everyone. But the fact that I asked that question let them know that I was concerned and that if there was something going on, they could talk to me, you know, after class, they could email me, things of that nature. So it opened that door in a way that I think is really critical. Um, we also might need to offer breaks or have a more flexible schedule so that students can take care of their needs. We don't know if they're having to work strange hours, work a different job, if they're having to take care of themselves in a different way than maybe we would expect or that we would think would be standard. So being able to be more flexible is really important. And then teaching to the whole person and to their safety needs. Again, we have to ask, are you, is everyone in a safe place? Do you have secure housing and employment? Not in the sense that we think we can fix all of these issues, but that they feel comfortable and they know that we are willing to discuss it with them at least. We 
want to create a supportive and calm setting so that when they come into our course, you know, our online course, that we have, you know, kind of nice, a nice demeanor. You know, I had a, an observation during this kind of crisis time through someone in the department and I was, you know, sort of anxious as we might get when we're being observed by another professor or an administrator. But they, they noted that when people came into the course, I said, oh, hi, how are you know, Jane's here and Tom's here and Jose's here and kind of said hello and checked on them. Um, I would do things like if they didn't have their camera on, I would ask them to turn on their camera at least for a few minutes at the beginning and the end of course. So that was a way for me to sort of observe how they were doing, um, get a look at them. You know, you can kind of see are they taking care of their basic needs, what's their affect like. So there is a benefit to just being able to check in that way. Um, another thing you can do is to have a support system, like maybe you have an email group for your course, or you have an online discussion board. So someone could go on there and say, hey, I'm looking for an apartment in this neck of the woods, or I'm looking for a job, or I, you know, they can reach out in a way that is time sensitive and hopefully helpful to them. So social means. This is really tricky when we're in a situation, A, tr online environment just in general can be difficult for taking care of a learner's social needs. But then when you add in the fact that now we're doing social distancing and there's a lot of other things that are keeping us from people. So we want to try as much as we can to put social learning activities and resources into that e-learning strategy. And I will tell you, I was not trained as someone to do remote or e-learning. So I really had to figure things out as I'm still figuring things out as we go, which is part of why I'm excited about this session today. I'm excited to have breakout sessions with you all and hear what you do and what works and what doesn't work. And we've certainly been doing things with ICU DDR to practice and try new things. Um, for example, we're doing the UTC, we just completed the UTC walkthrough in our African region and they've done some excellent work, things that were traditionally icebreakers or activities that they've done online. So one thing you can do, I know not everyone loves group projects, but at this time there are benefits to having our learners work together to maybe do an online assignment, like a blog or a presentation, or things that kind of require them to come out of their shell and their comfort zone at this time and work together. We can encourage them to discuss key topics with their peers on social media, on online forums, give them a lot of opportunities to connect and communicate with other learners to avoid feelings of isolation. One thing that I did in my course, those of you who have heard me present before know that I am always, I will always talk about self-care and this is a really important time to do so. So I had them in our course, I had them share one thing they were doing to do self-care during this time. And I think it was really helpful. I mean, it created more social connection, but it also gave them ideas. You know, some of them were like, oh, I'm riding my bike. You know, that's how I'm getting out of the house and doing something different and getting activity. And other ones said, oh yeah, I, I could get a bike. That's something good that I can do. So I, this seems like a, and just a simple comment, but I think it's really important that while we have our professional boundaries, we want them to feel that we're a human being, that there's a social connection, and that we're accessible. As I as mentioned, you know, relationship is key. So now we're getting, we're going up that pyramid. Now we're at esteem needs. Learners need to feel confident and capable in order to fulfill these needs. So we want to give them opportunities to participate, to do assignments, and we want to give praise when they successfully complete a task. So we can, even if the quality of work needs improvement, just being able to give people feedback what they, that they completed the assignment, and then whatever it is we can say that is positive about that assignment, and there should always be something that we can say that's positive. Um, recently learned about the, the idea of a um, feedback sandwich, where you have your positive thing you say at the beginning, and then whatever you need them to work on in the middle, and then you end with something positive and especially during this time where people might be more sensitive, that's a really positive way to package it. 
And then asking them, it's funny, um, my partner and I both have children who finish their semester online and you would hear the teachers asking them, what do you like about online learning? What don't you like? And they were kind of tired of that question, but I think it's really important that we ask, our, especially our adult students, what did you like about this? What did you enjoy or not enjoy? Um, and really take that to heart because we're learning as we go and we want them to be part of the process. And then we get up to our self-actualization needs. We may not get there during this time, but it's important that we have our eyes there at least. So we're aiming for self-actualization needs, allowing our students to fulfill their potential, including creative activities, so we want to encourage them to set realistic goals and track their progress. I like to talk to my students about what their goals are as we, not just in the course, but in general. And then we can offer them reflection activities that prompt them to think about their current beliefs and question their current assumptions. I've used some really powerful writing activities in class. Again, it was not to my specific training as a criminologist and addiction professional. Um, an administrator, but I've learned a lot about the power of writing. So I've had students reflect at the beginning of class, whether in class, in person, or now online, and it helps them to think differently and it shows them a way to be more creative. It's our responsibility to give them tools and knowledge they need to realize their true potential and purpose so they can strive towards their own personal definition of success, not what we think would be their definition. So one thing that's really difficult, and we talked about this a little bit in some presentations yesterday, is that students might have been avoiding online classes and suddenly that's not an option, right? We're all sort of forced to, um, whether it's teach or participate as a student or a learner, we have these online courses. And so knowing that that's, they may be resistant to that and not taking that resistance as something personally against what we have to offer, but just as something to work with, to try to, like we would do as a counselor, sort of roll with that resistance and see what we can do. And that's something where, you know, I share personally with my students, like, yeah, this isn't what I planned either. Let's, let's try to figure it out together. And I think that partnering means a lot to them and cuts through some of the resistance. As mentioned earlier, home life or the environment in which people are living can really be impactful. So, you know, I had a student last semester who let me know that five people in their family were either in the hospital or bedridden due to COVID. Um, they weren't necessarily asking me, this was a really engaged student and I sort of started to notice that she wasn't as engaged, so I talked to her about it. Um, again, going back to that relationship and knowing our students. And so, you know, she, she obviously needed some adaptation of the course because she was not going to be able to fully engage, fully participate with people literally in the next room who were quarantining and who were very ill. So again, it's not that we can necessarily always do something for those students, although we may be able to adapt what they have to complete for the course or give them options, but just the fact that we're paying attention, we're aware of the challenges they're facing and we are there for support. And of course, we can all relate to technological issues that may include low bandwidth, not having online access, not having computers or laptops at all. Um, there are times when we can assist with this probably more than we think. There have been some um, programs that have assisted with getting internet for different areas of the world. Um, there are programs I know in the US and probably other places where you can get laptops and computers. So even just being aware that that's an option and sending the student to look for things like that or helping them with a quick Google search or being able to look and see if there are things that your institution maybe has available to them. I know that um, some institutions are able to loan out laptops and things like that. Um, or try, sometimes we have to adapt if people don't have, if they're not able to come synchronously to our course because of low bandwidth, then can we record the course? Or can we um, in some other way share the information if they're not able to come right when we would like them to? 
And I think motivation, support, and drive are all really important. Someone who, as I mentioned, was really gung-ho and engaged and there every day, and now they're not, what's different? You know, is it the is it the format? Is it them being back at home? Is there something that we can do to help and support them? And then, as I said, I'm always going to bring you back to self-care, um, both for you and for your students. I think that if we don't focus on self-care, we won't have anything to give to the students, and they won't have anything to give to the course. So um, again, not our job to dictate, not our job to ensure that they're doing it, but make sure that we're talking about it. I think that it meant a lot to my students that I asked them, what are you doing for self-care? I asked them towards the beginning of the course and they some kind of didn't know how to answer and some had ideas about they were going on drives or they were taking out, you know, they were um, riding their bike or they were just taking some deep breaths and things like that. But then as we went along and they kind of knew I was going to ask them about that, I think that it became more of a priority and they paid more attention to that concept. So what is it that they can do to take care of themselves during this time? And that's going to be different for everyone, obviously based on resources, but it's absolutely necessary and absolutely possible for all of our students and ourselves. And um, you know, maybe we maybe we have to remind them, encourage them, or send them links, or send them things to let them know that there are um, there are things that they can do for self care. So, with that said, I am done with my piece of our presentation today, and I believe that we will be moving into breakout rooms so we can discuss. Um, I did see, let me look real quickly, I did see a question. For some students living in schools and escape for domestic problems they're encountering at home, how do you think their emotional state can be managed vis-a-vis -vis learning from home during this COVID-19 period? Thank you, Fatima, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that we, It's incredibly difficult. I agree that being at school can really be a, um, it can be a saving grace for so many people. Um, I think I would like to suggest that we bring that question into our breakout rooms and discuss that further. Because I don't just, I have some ideas, but I definitely don't have the answer. So with that, I will shush and let, let us, uh, let my moderators and our awesome Craig, who I don't know if you've been recognized in this presentation yet today, but thank you, Craig, for everything you've been doing for us. I will let you guys take over. Great, thank you.